Hi there, this is Kevin from MaximizingEcommerce.com and in this video we're going to talk about some basic terminology for running an e-commerce business and specifically some concepts and terms related to selling on Amazon. Now you may be wondering, okay, uh, why do I need to learn this, uh, this lingo, so to speak? Well, it's going to help you have um, uh, better ability to research. So if you're reading blog posts or listening to podcasts or YouTube channels, which you should, um, it definitely is helpful as you're looking to start a business in e-commerce. Uh, what that's going to do is by better learning the lingo, you're going to pick up a lot of the concepts that people are talking about. Uh, it helps you if you're looking to join the discussion on uh, Facebook groups or forums. That way you can feel more confident uh, engaging in the discussion and uh, hopefully helping others as well as uh, getting information for yourself. And then also if you're communicating with suppliers, it's good just to know the general lingo of what people are talking about. Um, it definitely makes you sound more confident and should help you in negotiations as well. So let's talk about some basic terms again for Amazon. So one of the most basic concepts is going to be your account, your seller account. So everything links back to your account. So whether you're doing this as an individual person or you have an LLC you're doing as a company, uh, it's all going to link to your account. Um, it's probably going to be the same uh, email address and uh, contact info is your buyer account. So just as you have a buyer account when you go to Amazon.com and you buy something and it's already got your credit card information and address logged in, uh, it's the same thing for a seller account, except instead of doing it as a seller, you're doing it as a buyer. So it's got uh, uh, tax information, your inventory, all kinds of stuff your history with Amazon, it's all linked to your seller account. So there's two different types of seller accounts. Uh, first off, there's an individual account, which um, if you're considering doing this, I would say just go out and go out and register as an individual seller. It costs you absolutely nothing to do so. Um, the only cost involved, or I should say there's no cost on the front end, there is a cost involved. And the cost is you pay an extra 99 cents for every sale you make. Now you don't even pay that 99 cents until you make a sale. So there's a few fees you pay every time a uh, sale is made, but as an individual seller, uh, you have no upfront costs and you just pay 99 cents per sale. Now you can save that if you register as a professional seller. Now as a professional seller, you pay $40 a month. So if you're going to sell at least 40 products, it's definitely worth your while to do. Also as a professional seller, you get the uh, ability to have some more, we'll call them bells and whistles, uh, being able to run sponsored product ads, which we'll talk a little bit more about here later in this video. And uh, you've got ability to potentially sell in more categories. Um, you got quite a few other uh, perks, let's say. So once you've got up and running and you can sell at least 40 products a month, then it's worth your while to have the professional account. Um, and once you get to that milestone, it's definitely the professional account is the way to go. But as just starting out individual is uh, my recommendation. It's how I did it when I first started out. And then eventually when I got to the point of selling, you know, over 40 in a month, then it was most certainly worth my while. And at this point I get um, definitely my money's worth on that uh, $40 a month. In fact, it's a, it's a great investment, but don't make that investment until it's time for you. Um, so another basic terminology or basic term, I should say, uh, when it comes to selling on Amazon is Amazon is a marketplace. So if you think back to a couple hundred years ago, uh, let's say you had a town square where sellers would gather to sell, maybe they were selling fruits and vegetables or a blacksmith was selling horseshoes or whatever it was someone was selling you had people coming together to buy things. So if you were buying something as a customer, you would go to wherever that marketplace is because you knew you would be able to find certain things. And that still kind of works today. Uh, malls, basically a, a marketplace uh, with different stores and whatnot. Now, 
Amazon is a virtual version of this. So a lot of people don't realize this because uh, you go on Amazon and you purchase something. It looks like you're buying it from Amazon. So a lot of people don't realize that when they're buying on Amazon, that oftentimes they're actually buying from a third party seller. And in fact, about half of all sales made on Amazon are actually made by third party sellers, uh, which is crazy that um, so many sales are made by actually companies other than Amazon. So whether individual sellers or other companies that sell their product on Amazon, um, because Amazon is a marketplace and it allows others to sell on it. So as a third party seller, um, when you sell something, uh, if the customer places the order, they of course have to have it shipped to them. So things are fulfilled to them two different ways. One of which is fulfillment by Amazon known as FBA and fulfillment by Amazon is basically where the seller has inventory of certain products. And rather than keeping inventory products at their location, uh, they send those products to Amazon or keep an inventory of products with Amazon. And then once the sale is made, Amazon's workers, they take that um, off the shelf at their warehouse, which they call fulfillment centers. And what they'll do is they will then, um, you know, box it up and ship it out to the, to the customer. So it's very uh, hands off, which is why this is a very popular program. So it's relatively hands off for the seller. And then there's fulfillment by merchant. So, um, as a as a seller you have the ability to send out the orders yourself so if an order came in to john smith and poughkeepsie um for a coffee press let's just say then you get the order and you ship it from your you know your house your warehouse your office wherever it is you're shipping from um, and then Amazon is basically just acting as the place where the transaction was made and was helping to bring the customer there and just pay a small commission fee. Um, so that's the fulfillment by merchant channel. Now, theoretically, you could do things both ways. You could actually set up products to do both ways. Now, it's better to do fulfillment by Amazon if you can, because you tend to get a little bit of a bump um, in sales by doing fulfillment by Amazon because you're able to sell as prime. Um, so it's 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 a, it's a good way to sell products is uh, fulfillment by Amazon. So it, again, it's a very popular program because it is relatively hands off. All right. So as well as fulfillment by Amazon and FBA uh, and FBM fulfillment by merchant. So those ways of fulfilling, um, you got to have products to sell. So there's a couple different ways that people source their products. So one, uh, oftentimes is referred to as retail arbitrage RA. Now on RA, what that is, is basically you'd go out to a retail store and sometimes they have things on clearance or uh, products are being phased out or seasonal products are being moved um, at a price that's really getting them to sell so that the store has the ability to use that shelf space for something else. And whatever the reason is that something's being de deeply discounted, if there's a profit to be made, um, that's where people use this retail arbitrage RA strategy, uh, where you buy low at a store and sell high on Amazon. As long as the costs work out that it's profitable, uh, it could be a, a very good thing. And now there's also the online arbitrage version where you hear people talk about like maybe like instead of buying things at Target, they're buying it on like eBay or it could still be a, a major retailer like Walmart.com or whatever the case is. They buy low online and sell high on Amazon. Then there's another concept called wholesaling where you get a, another company's product and you buy larger quantities of it. So you might be direct, buying directly from the manufacturer or from a distributor. Um, and then as long as there's margins, then you're selling that product on Amazon. And then there's private label, which is basically you're working directly with a factory, putting on uh, your own brand name and maybe making some small tweaks here or there, maybe with packaging or uh, small modifications. Uh, but basically the gist is the the heart and soul, so to speak, of that product is something that's already existing from the factory. Then there's basically where you could be creating your own product. 
And when you create your own product, you could be working with factory to create new molds, uh, new designs, whatever the case is. And by mold, I mean um, whatever it is they use to shape uh, that that particular product. Um, you know, so the factory is making something that's specifically designed for you and your company. Uh, all of these different ways to source products have their ups and downs. Um, it's not like Amazon's going to say you have to only source products one particular way. Uh, but the nice thing is you could theoretically do all five. And another important concept is going to be the buy box. Now the buy box is this add to cart button here on the right hand side. So if I was to look up this particular uh, French press coffee maker on the right hand side, I, if I wanted to buy it, the simplest way to do it is just hit that little add to cart. And if you've ever purchased something on Amazon, um, you've seen that add to cart button. It's very simple. Most people when they buy, they buy from this particular add to cart button. And the reason for that is it is so simple. It's just right there. I see the product I want. I go on the listing. It's, it's immediately available. Now, down below it, I would be able to also see other sellers selling on Amazon. And in this particular case, there's these two that they'd be showing on the same page as the buy box. But then there's also 28 total sellers. So on this page, we're seeing only three. Um, Amazon is the one that has the buy box there. Uh, so it's Amazon is the one selling it. But there are a couple of third party sellers. They're putting up front, so to speak, because they're on that main page. But if I clicked on that page or that link down below where it says 28, um, I'd be able to see that there's 28 total sellers selling this product. Now, of course, if I'm a customer, I'm probably just going to go with the best deal. So whoever has the buy box is most likely to get the sale. Now you're wondering, OK, who does Amazon decide to have the buy box? Well, they have a fairly complex, I wouldn't say it's fairly, it is a very complex algorithm. No one fully knows what's in the algorithm, but if you think of it from the standpoint of at the end of the day, Amazon wants the customer to feel like they had a good experience and they got a good deal. So generally speaking, the things that are going to have a major impact on who has the buy box is the um, price and then also um whether or not it's prime because prime members like to buy prime. So if you're a prime member yourself, uh, like, like me, uh, you probably only buy things that have that little check mark and then the blue prime next to it. So you can see this particular product does have uh, prime capabilities. So that means if I bought it, I could have free two day shipping. So prime members tend to only want to buy things that are eligible for prime. Now, uh, this particular product has 28 sellers and they're all competing for the buy box. So one of the reasons people like doing private label or having their own product is if they're the exclusive seller of that product, they will always have the buy box. Now, some people like to do retail arbitrage and online arbitrage because they can move the product fast enough or they don't buy an, that many of a particular item so that if it takes them, you know, a month or two or three, uh, or whatever the time it takes them, they've got a, a whole formula, then uh, whenever it is their turn, so to speak, to get the buy box because of pricing or whatever the case is or whatever strategies they use to get the buy box, um, then it's worth it to them. Now, the key to remember here is if you have that main buy box, you are going to be the one who's going to get the sale. So whether it be a product that sells 100 a day or uh, three a month, and there's a wide range of products and how much they sell on Amazon. But if you have the buy box, whenever somebody goes to buy, you are most likely going to be the one that gets that sale. All right. Also, it's good to know on Amazon about different product identifiers and everything basically works with a barcode. So you can see here there's a, what appears to be a UPC code and you may be familiar with the idea of a universal product code, a UPC. And if you've gone to the store and you bought something and the cashier scans it, they're typically scanning off of a UPC. And a UPC is going to be the same everywhere, hence why it's called the universal. So for a particular product, it's always going to be the same. So if I bought a Monopoly game at Toys R Us, let's just say, um, if I went to Target 
and I was to buy that Monopoly game, um, and it's the same version of it, then it's going to most likely have that same UPC code because it's it's universal. It's the same everywhere. So it doesn't matter um, where you bought a product. It's most likely going to have the same UPC code. Then there's the European version of it called a European article number, an EAN. For the most part, if you're in the United States, you're going to work with UPCs. And oftentimes you can buy UPCs because um, you're going to need a UPC for each product you have, which is actually more simple than it sounds. Um, but the EAN oftentimes is just the UPC code with an extra digit on it. So it might have like a zero on the front or whatever the case is. It depends on where you buy it. But if you are going to buy UPC codes and you have aspirations of maybe one day selling in Europe, it's not a bad idea to also get an EAN number um, or a UPC number that could also become an EAN number, which oftentimes they can. Then there's what's referred to as an ASIN, and you'll hear that term quite a bit, the Amazon Standard Identification Number. So each particular product on Amazon has an Amazon-specific number. So when you go on Amazon and you're shopping and you click on the link to go see the listing for a particular product, so in that listing page for the product, um, that particular listing has an ASIN assigned to it. And the ASIN is specific to that particular item. And it doesn't matter who's selling it. It's that particular item. So going back to a Monopoly game. So the Monopoly game would have a UPC code. that would be the same as uh, someplace else. And then if that Monopoly game um, was being sold on Amazon, Amazon's going to sign an ASIN number. Then there's referred to as an FN SKU, a Fulfillment Network Stock Keeping Unit. And you may have heard the term SKU, Stock Keeping Unit, but the FN SKU is an Amazon term for basically each seller on there is going to be assigned a FN SKU for their product. So this gets a little confusing. So we'll walk through here the difference between an ASIN and an FN SKU. So if I'm looking at this particular product here that we were looking at before, this French press coffee maker, um, if I was to scroll down a little bit lower on the page, I would come to this product information area. Now on there, you'll see that there's the ASIN. So it's that ASIN there on the bottom left. Now the B000KEM4TQ, uh, that basically is how Amazon knows what this product is. So this is an Amazon's database that they know this particular product, that particular ASIN is the uh, Bowdoin Brazil 8 cup French press coffee maker. Now, going back to the concept before that there was 28 sellers. So each of those 28 sellers is actually going to have their own F and SKU. So they may sell other products and their other products each have their own F and SKU for that particular seller, but each seller on this particular ASIN. So all sellers are going to be selling the same ASIN, but each seller is going to have their own FN SKU for this particular product. All right. So then let's talk a little bit about sponsored ads. You may have seen these before when you're shopping yourself on Amazon or shopping for yourself on Amazon. Now, if you see on the right hand side where it says sponsored, sponsored is kind of somewhat grayed out. It's hard to see. Uh, you might even miss it, but it's typically going to be at the top of the page um, in a row and then a column going down on the right hand side. That's typically where you're going to see sponsored ads. Amazon's always doing little tests here and there and they change it up just to see if they get better conversions, if they put them out in a certain way. But we'll walk through uh, some basic concepts here for sponsored ads. So the way it works is it's a bidding system. So each seller um, is bidding to get their particular product uh, put on that page for a particular keyword. So if they wanted to bid on the keyword for, let's say, French press coffee maker or French press or coffee press, those are all different keywords. And so they're bidding that every time someone clicks on it, they'll pay maybe 40 cents or a dollar or whatever the case is that makes sense to them when they try to factor in what's referred to as the average cost of sales, sometimes referred to as ACOS. And what ACOS is, is let's say um, you had spent $300 on sponsored ads and you made $1,000 in sales. 
So if you do the math there, $300 in uh, clicks divided by $1,000 in sales would be 30%. So the average cost of sale would be 30%. So when you factor in the other costs, was it profitable to you? And if it was, then it's worth continuing to do. And uh, you see how this is a particular um, sponsored listing that we're seeing there. Now, you want the, your results to show up what we call organically. And organically means it was not because you paid for it. And Amazon is going to show whatever when someone looks up particular keyword like so let's go back to French press coffee maker so if somebody looks up French press coffee maker Amazon knows that there's history of certain products that are selling when people purchase that they'll bump those products up higher and higher in the organic listing so instead of maybe being on page eight it might be on page two or even page one and for lack of a better word, you could say it helps to kind of juice up sales or prime the pump, so to speak, by using these sponsored ads because Amazon doesn't really care that much. I'm sure it's factored in their algorithm somewhere, but they don't care that much whether it was because of a sponsored ad or if it was because of an organic listing. They just, uh, someone searched for a keyword and they ended up on a particular uh, listing page and they made the sale. So it, if the A cost can work out, it's worth your while. Now, what you're ultimately doing is you're getting impressions. So for example, here, when we see these uh, three coffee makers, so when I looked up whatever term I looked up, let's say it was coffee press, and those came up, that was called an impression. Now, there's lots of impressions it takes to get to a sale. So let's say if I had a thousand impressions, uh, maybe 20 people clicked on them. Uh, so that would be a 2% of the people of the impressions people clicked on. Now of that, you want to have a conversion. So if you had 20 people click on it and let's say four of them resulted in sales, that's a 20% conversion rate. So basically everything's kind of a formula. And once you start learning some of these basic formulas, of what's profitable and what works as far as having good conversions because at the end of the day that's what Amazon wants they want conversions conversions prove this is a, a product that customers want and they're willing to buy so it's also good to know how do sellers and products perform and there's a few different terms for that so one is called the best seller rank now you might think that's about the seller themselves but it's actually going to be about the product so um, this same coffee press that we've been looking at here uh, you can see there there's the best seller rank and the way it works is you see here that this particular product is ranked 404 in home and kitchen so home and kitchen is a category so 404 is really highly ranked so the smaller the number the more high highly it's ranked and it's all based on the amount of sales and sales volume it's doing so this particular product is also number two in home and kitchen kitchen and dining coffee and tea and espresso coffee makers french presses that was a mouthful because each one of those is going to be called a subcategory now if you're ever gauging how much a product sells you can do so by just looking at what the best seller ranking is, the BSR, um, but always make sure you're looking at the, we'll call it the parent uh, category, because the subcategory is going to vary wildly between products. Now, also something in 404 in home and kitchen is going to perform differently than, let's say, 404 in office products, because home and kitchen is going to be a, a more popular um, category that more people are buying things off of so but if you're looking apples to apples of things in home and kitchen you would know that this particular product sells more at ranked 404 than something's ranked let's say 250,000 in home and kitchen so it's a, a nice way to gauge you can never know exactly how many things it sells but you can get a pretty good gauge whereas that this might be selling 50 to 100 units a day if it's staying consistently at this particular bestseller ranking and bestseller rankings they change it's not like oh they made the bestseller ranking for the week i mean i believe they change hourly and it all depends on how much that product is selling relative to other products in the same category so Let's also talk about how customers rank, review, 
um, give their feedback. So you see star ratings quite a bit. Now there's a couple different ways that uh, sellers and products are reviewed. And one is the product review. So that is of the product itself. It doesn't even necessarily matter who the seller is. Um, so for example, on our coffee press, um, you saw that there were star ratings. And we'll, we'll take a look at that here in a minute. And then there's also seller feedback. So seller feedback is going to have a big bearing on um, the seller themselves and sometimes whether or not people buy a product from that particular seller. Is that seller trustworthy? And we'll show you an example here in a moment. So for one, let's take a look here at the um, product review for our coffee press that we were looking at earlier. So on this particular one, this is a listing that's clearly well established because it has 2,700 customer reviews. It takes a while to get that many reviews. In fact, I think I saw earlier, I didn't point this out, but it was 2004 is when this particular coffee press came out. So it's been around a long time and it's built up a good reputation over time. Four and a half stars is good. Most people are very happy buying a product that's in the four to five star range. Um, if it's less than four stars, it can be a little harder to sell that product just because um, think about your own buying. You want to buy the best and you want to see what other people have to say. And if other people have good things to say, you're more likely to buy it. So this is a, what's called a product review. Then there's also what we're going to call seller feedback. Now, seller feedback would be back to this same example where there was 28 sellers for this particular coffee press. Now, if I clicked over there where it says used and new 28, it would take me to this page here where I would see all the sellers that are selling this particular product. And for this particular product, um, Amazon is the seller, so you can see them there in the middle. Now, Amazon Warehouse Deals is basically if something is damaged in the warehouse, uh, or lightly damaged, I should say. Sometimes they'll pass off deals to people as an Amazon warehouse deal. Um, it's not in perfect condition, but it's still decent. So they'll sell it as used. Um, and that's what Amazon warehouse deal is. And then you can see here also, there's, if I look down at the bottom, um, those two particular companies are 95% and 97% positive. So uh, like, for example, Gatsy's, I believe that is, they've got 148,000 reviews. Now, that's a very well-established company. If you're looking at this and you're thinking about buying this product and you're looking at price, you probably feel comfortable buying from a company that's 95% positive, four and a half stars. Um, over the course of uh, the last 12 months, they have that much positive feedback and 150,000 people almost have reviewed them. So you'd probably feel good about it. Whereas this isn't going to prevent someone from selling, but the company right above it, it says just launched. So that might have people feel a little bit more apprehensive now, but if it's being fulfilled by Amazon, some people are probably aren't even going to look. Um, but if you go up to the top, you see one particular company with 0% positive of four reviews. Now, hopefully for this company, we wish them well, and we hope that they, whatever issues they have are being figured out. But as a buyer, people might be less likely to buy. So if someone did make it, which most people just go with whatever the buy box is and click it and add to cart, but Amazon customers, and some of them are savvy and do this, they could look and see if there's a better deal somewhere. Now, as we all know, price doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have the best experience. So oftentimes customers will look here to see the reviews for a particular seller. So seller reviews can become very important, especially if you're competing with multiple sellers. So you could see here um, if you were buying and, and I very purposefully left price off price would be on the far left hand side of the page. But this shows you how your seller ratings and reviews or seller feedback is what they technically call it can have a big difference on whether or not you get the sale. So hopefully this video has helped you clarify a few terms when selling on Amazon. And if so, I'd love it if you could leave a thumbs up if you found this helpful, which uh, uh, tells YouTube that you liked the video as well as subscribe to the channel. Doing these two things helps other people find this video and hopefully we can help others as well. And also, if you have any questions or if there's anything you'd like clarified or maybe even something in a future video, hint, hint, um, you can leave a comment down below. And we try to do our best to read all the comments as well as to respond to as many as we possibly can. So if you are looking for exclusive tips, please go to maximizing e commerce 
amazonbusiness.com and sign up for um, some tips and resources to help you grow your Amazon business. And also, I just want to say thank you for watching this video and really just wishing you the best as you uh, work ahead to get ahead in your uh, e-commerce business. Thanks and have a great day.